je vais dire que c'est un, un espace de liberté, c'est un endroit où on peut encore, euh, je ne vais pas dire faire ce qu'on veut ou on veut comme on veut, mais en tout cas, ce pas des gens qui nous disent « fais pas ci, fais pas ça ». Ce que je trouve de vraiment cool ici, c'est qu'on te donne des informations euh, euh, terrain, et ensuite, c'est toi qui, euh, qui te prends en charge, en fait. Est, tu sais, on est dans un monde où tout est hyper cadré, on te dit tout ce qu'il faut faire. Là, c'est bien parce que tu es, es sous ta propre responsabilité. Pour moi, c'est vraiment ce qui ce qui m'attire ici, qui me plaît et qui me fait y rester. Quoi. 3, 2, 1, dropping. Ooh. Yeah, boy. Yeah, There is definitely a special aura around this place. It's uh, like how the village and the cable car are built on the bottom of this north face, which has like only one easy way to ski down. And all the other ski descents are pretty much uh, non-beginner friendly. To enjoy the terrain in La Graf, you need to have a knowledge about the, the whole mountaineering stuff. The, to rappel down gullies that are ending up on huge cliffs or just to travel on glaciers. And that's why La Graf is quite special. You either have your knowledge or you're better having a guide with you. Um, the game of patience, that's kind of what's changed here. People, people don't wait anymore. <laughs> if you wake up and it's bluebird and it's sunny and it's new snow, people are going. It's like off to the races. That's the biggest change I've seen in, in my time here. Village is the same and we love it the way it is. Oh, depuis les 15, 20 dernières années, le, la grave, je vais, oh, je vais pas dire que ça a changé parce que, 
ça reste toujours pareil, mais en fait, ça a évolué. On n'a on a plus du tout les mêmes skis, ce n'est plus la même approche. Moi, il y a 20 ans, quand je venais skier là, c'était le run euh, saucisson, bouteille de pif, au bout de trois, trois rotations, on s'arrêtait dans les vallons avec les potes, c'était cool. Maintenant, les, le matériel est devenu plus performant, ce qui est plus large, et puis ça ride à bloc en haut, en bas, et il faut en faire le plus possible, il faut aller faire sa trace. Faut... Je trouve que ça a évolué. Alors après, c'est pas ni mieux ni moins bien. Chaque époque a ses, ses avantages et ses inconvénients. A pretty special line we skied was the uh, Sirac Paradise with Benji. It was the third descent of it, and I think a lot of the guys around here have looked at the line for years, and uh, it takes a while to get into it, and then it's a pretty exposed exit underneath all the Siracs. Benji, we are at the Breche de la. Brèche du râteau maintenant. Brèche du râteau. On espère que la, la neige soit mieux de l'autre côté. Yep. Yeah. Go down here. We're gonna get another one. You can see Johnny. <laughs> Powder? Good. Yeah. Brèche de la Meche. There's a couple friends here having fun. Nice one. Got the skis back on. Going up. Sam's breaking trail again. Now it's only getting technical, right? Nice. All good. Everything's holding. Everything is holding. For now. Later. Later. Yeah, the special thing about this line is that you're really like rappelling almost two times 50 meters down to this exposed chute, which is um, quite steep, like 55 degrees descent, which is ending lower down on the plateau from where you really have to ski down fast because it's exposed to the Seracs. That's why the name Serac Paradise was uh, given to it. And for us, it was really a good, a good run to, to share with Benji. Yeah. Cold feet, tired legs. What else do we have here? Uh, Fun? Thanks, Adam. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, Benji. Thank you so You're much. You're really, yeah. really welcome.
the biggest appeal is the, just the, the sheer amount of vertical you get to ski. Uh, the skiing brought me here, but the, the community actually kept me here. The friends and people I've made in this, it's a pretty tight-knit village. It's a, it's, a, it's a small little family. That kind of kept me here, but when you can ski that much vertical, that fast, with that kind of access, with minimal crowds, it's kind of hard to go anywhere else. <laughs> The freedom, the freedom of Le Graf, the fact that there are no ropes saying don't go here, there are no people patrolling the piste saying you can't do this, you can't do that. Uh, that freedom is uh, pretty unique in uh, most Alpine areas, so uh, that, that freedom is uh, an incredible privilege that I hope will never go away. <laughs> yeah.
Sayad. I am a coordinator of community-based tourism at Istanbul. In Kyrgyzstan, right now we have a 15 group CBT, all is in the regions. They are trying to develop uh, rural ecological tourism. I am uh, in from Arsambo, which is located in the south part of Kyrgyzstan. 2006, we decided to develop winter tourism. Then we had the two skiers, we were really proud because the first time we had the skiers finally. Last year, 2014, we had 70 skiers. This year, I think, will be more than because uh, we are in uh, in a lot of articles in the magazine. Uh, even in Swiss Alpine Club, we are we are there, and then a lot of people now thinking come to Kyrgyzstan and then ski and then discover Kyrgyzstan because uh, you know Kyrgyzstan, uh, more than 94 percent land is covered by mountains, high mountains. That's why we are starting to develop winter tourism. Here, past ten and all grads. It's underground all the time. Zero, zero degrees. Yeah, right? close to the ground. Yes, yeah, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Okay, and then this needs to be perpendicular to the snow. <laughs> good, good, okay, okay, like him. <laughs> carry on, carry on. It's good. A bit more. Today is uh, really foggy and wet again. The snow is not really good, so we decided we're gonna build a bank slalom slash slop style for the kids. Okay, we are ready. Okay. Oh, yeah. are walking uphill for an hour and a half with their ski gear, then just lapping all day with a huge smile on their faces, not a single complaint, just <laughs> thought to be up there and a real true passion for ski. Jump! <laughs> but they say no, I have uh, three children. We have a gear for guys and the faction team. Okay. I had over you some, uh, some gear we took with us and we really would like to thank you for your hospitality. Yeah, okay. Here you are. Uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> you, you remember? I remember. Yeah, yeah. I did like that. <laughs> Famous pictures. <laughs> <laughs> we went to Kyrgyzstan to bring here to this community. And in the end, we got so much back than we expected. They really opened their home and shared their culture with us. It was such an inspirational trip.
drove to the country to achieve the second goal of our trip. Sleep in the yacht and finally ride back. A good start by all four of these women, and Anis Moran squeezes out Jacqueline Legere for second place, just behind Amanda Trunzo. Anis Moran with great edge work, and Jacqueline Legere is, oh, she's struggling a little bit now. She's well back and forth behind Miriam Trepanier through the Nissan chicane. Amanda Trunzo, solid on those edges, solid skating. Anis Moran right there. Keeping a close eye on the line. BF Goodrich rock drop. Trunzo easily manages it. Anise Moran right there as the two front runners open up a huge gap on Amanda, or excuse me, 
on um, Jacqueline Legere and Miriam Trapagne. Surprised to see Jacqueline Legere so far back. Amanda Trunzo, a nice lead now on the rest, but Anise Moran not giving any space at all to Amanda Trunzo, pushing hard across the finish line. Oh, oh my goodness, how close was that? Anise Moran keeps pushing hard to the finish. Miriam Trapagne loops out just to the finish line, and there comes Jacqueline Legere. What I'm really impressed by is how fantastic Anise Moran looked in that race. She almost took Trunzo off the start, but Trunzo pinched her off in this corner. You can see the reason Jacqueline got relegated to the back, she took a little fall before the roller section right here, popped back up, but even just that minuscule up and down will cost you big time. But like you said, Troy, what's really interesting here was Anais, like literally losing this race by a skate. Like it just shows the level she has come to getting better and better. She is gonna be the one to really push on Trunzo in the future, along with Jacqueline Legere and Marion Trapagne. So all four of these women, just extraordinary racing. Big start by Scott Croxall. He's got that inside line locked up. Mirko Lati right there with him. Luca Delago sitting in third place right now, trying to block out big Kyle Croxall. Kyle Croxall making a great line on the inside, though. He takes over the lead ahead of Luca Delago. Excuse me. Mirko Lati now sitting in second place. Just Scott goes down. Scott goes down. Scott goes down early in the Nissan chicane. That leaves a wide open for Mirko Lati, who could well take the win here for the first time. And it will be a first big win for him in the senior level. But he's got Kyle Croxall right there with him, as Kyle's I said earlier on. These two guys are very similar. Kyle looking for that line, and he may well find it. Here comes Luca Delago. He is sneaky, he is fast, he is tricky, and he is good to go. And Scott Kyle Croxall can't outside. find it. Helos goes down earlier, and Kyle Croxall makes the pass on the inside, and Kyle Croxall's got a win. He has got the 1,000 points here in Ivescula. Mirko Lati was so close, but he'll have second place. That is a huge goal for Kyle Croxall right now, and an absolute fantastic win which means Kyle Croxall should take over the lead in the overall standings. And Scott Croxall disappointed with a nice run to start things off, but made a big mistake in that Nissan chicane where he just lost his footing in all that snow covered ruts. Let's look at this from the start. So Scott gets a great start as expected. Mirko right behind him, Luca coming in third. Now Kyle's in fourth position that Point. Keep in mind, but he always has a way of staying composed. He makes an early pass right here on Luca. So that's number one pass coming around this corner. He comes to the inside, skates his way out. So now he's got his brother and Lati in front. Coming through the Nissan chicane, Scott takes a bad line, gets caught in the ruts, and goes down. Tough break for Scott, but that completely opened the door for Mirko to take this thing home. Now you can never count out Kyle Crocs, so the momentum he gains on this track is incredible, especially after the rock drop. That is where he makes it happen, and Lati could not do anything. TV UK, Sarah Duffy here from Mount Buller in Australia. Our ski season is between June and October every single year and we would love to see you for a ski down under sometime soon.
I'm Shemi Olcott, Ski Club of Great Britain Ambassador. Now this is my favourite workout, the resistant band workout. This little guy is super compact, you can throw it in your bag and work out absolutely anywhere and it really does enhance your workout by adding resistance so you build muscles quicker. First up we have an exercise I learnt when I skied with the Canadian ski team. Place the band above your knees, feet hip width apart. Making sure the other hip stays still, rotate one knee in and pull back out into alignment. Repeat on the other side before lowering into a squat. Sticking with the quad muscles, use a thinner large resistance band because next up we have the box squat. Step onto the band, feet shoulder width apart, raise the band above your head with wide straight arms. Trying to keep your upper body tall by pulling your shoulder blades together, lower your tailbone towards the ground. Using the same band, moving on to our first hamstring exercise, again stand on the band, feet hip width apart, raising the band over your neck and holding it tight to your chest. Drop your hips back whilst lowering your upper body forward with big emphasis on keeping a straight back. Finish the movement at the top by squeezing your glutes so that your hips end slightly forward. Next up we have a two progression small band hamstring exercise. First up legs only superman place the band above your knees and extend one leg behind you with the foot pointing down try and keep the hips level throughout slightly more challenging is the same movement pattern but standing either supported by a chair or the wall put one foot in the band and extend to a straight leg behind you Taking a lighter resistance band if possible, place the band just above your ankles and adopt a plank position. Squeezing the glutes, keeping your core engaged, pulse your straight leg twice towards the sky. Using the same band placed above your knees, drop down to a side plank on your knees. Lift the top leg up and down, keeping your body in one straight line. You can also hold in between pulses for a bigger muscle burn. This is another favourite that you see all over Ski Racer's Instagram accounts, the Monster Walk. Place the band above your knees, sinking your hips to the ground in a semi-squat. Step laterally, making sure you lock your hips parallel to the ground. The lower you go, the tougher this becomes. Next up we have the monster crawl. Drop down to the ground, moving forward using your opposite hand and leg with level hips. More challenging is to then crawl backwards. Using two longer bands, one to make an anchor, loop the lighter band through. With slight tension on the band, stand facing your pillar or banister with feet hip width apart and a small knee bend. Move down into a squat and as you extend up, rotate to the side, straightening your arms and letting your back foot extend onto the toes, like the finish of a golf swing. Place the stronger band over your hips. Holding the band with your inside hand, take a small lateral lunge away from the pillar, pushing up and off to balance on the inside leg with parallel locked hips. Ending on my favourite exercise, the only way I have ever found to get massive ski angles without actually being on snow. With the same band layout and positioning as the last exercise, move away from the pillar so the bands are in full tension so that they can take your body weight. 
Keeping your feet planted, slowly move your ankles, knees and hips away from the pillar, simulating high ski edge angle. Once you're at your biggest edge angle, use the spring from the band to power your hips into a neutral transition position. If you want to see more of my ski fitness videos, then please check out the Ski Club of Great Britain YouTube channel. Thanks for joining me and have a great time on the slopes. The area is so great and so big that there are a lot of possibilities around. It's a cradle of alpine skiing here in Austria, that's for sure. It was the first ski school and we are doing like off-piece skiing since 1927, I guess. Big history. <laughs> Lovely resort. Our first time here. Nice little area skiing ski out where we're sitting, St. Christoph. There's a lot of people from Britain here, Sweden, Norway, Russians. It's holiday season now in, in Holland. So we thought uh, it, was, it, was, it would be really crowded, but it isn't at all. Fika, in the lift! In the lift! In the lift, both of you! Both of you! Come here to go off piste um, and enjoy the off piste game. It's, it's mainly for the off piste because we're doing an off piste uh, course for the week. First day we've skied the Veluga, off the back of the Veluga oh, down to Zers. Mm. Um, great, was was snow and the snow in there is fantastic. It it's uh, powdery, yeah, very very nice. So I came up with the kids yesterday and we skied off the top. But I'm bringing my wife up today, just to split passengers, so that she can see the view. Take out the view. Breathtaking. Yeah. quite good for a beginner as well because you see like how people ski because you've got very good skiers around here so it's a good motivation to keep on training to be as good as them. <laughs> go upper ski. <laughs> well, you can go to uh, crazy kangaroo or most of it if you're here, you should do that. Can't. She told us to come here. <laughs> we come here every year because there's great food, there's great dancing, and the skiing for a really long time. Go here every year just to go down the slide. <laughs> Oh, oh yes, yes, yes. Oh, yeah. oh yeah, they did girls, yeah. didn't they? Yeah, they did. Down, slide down at the toilet. Yeah. It's easier than going down the steps. <laughs> That's a lot of fun. Uh, yeah. it's just <laughs> we, That's a lot of fun, I have to say. That's the best sledging we've done, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> this thing's amazing, isn't it? So much fun. So much fun. I did it last week and these guys were like, let's do it again. I was like, yes, let's do it again. <laughs>
Hi Ski TV UK, Sarah Duffy here from Mount Buller in Australia. Our ski season is between June and October every single year and we would love to see you for a ski down under sometime soon. where my story begins. An electric forest of towering glass trees and iridescent lights. Amongst a dense and suffocating population, where the rich Oriental culture is overlapped with American influence, it seems all is tainted with Westernization in our modern days. In a city that runs a perilous succession along time's infinite passage, life surges onward both day and night, where construction never ends as the need to expand mounts along with the multiplying population. An economic monarch poised upon the Pacific's edge. It's here where my home is. Another face in the masses. Another being making their way along life's steady current. The journey from British Columbia, from the stifling boundaries of Hong Kong, is like stepping out of a crowded room to breathe in the clean air outside. The endless expanse of untamed land provides the necessary clarity to complete my story. As I pursue my vision across the Pacific, I begin to realize that not every aspect of this world was presented in the form of a reverberating hub of technology. Hong Kong's strict confines offer no privacy, nowhere to hide, and nowhere to reflect. But, as I follow Kieran Nicola into this expansive and foreign land, the mountains present themselves as an ideal escape. A place where my vision can prosper. Those who cultivate their lives along a visual path discover the inner somnolence which accompanies free and remote environments. Mountains that reach toward the sky and house flourishing environments. 
forest woodlands blanket their unique and unmatched textures with luscious lividity. Where snow melts into cascading streams running vapid courses through emerald forests. feed into frigid lakes. A place where the atmosphere is unmarred by industry. And the earth is free to shape itself as it wills. Anatoly Burkreev once said, Mountains are not stadiums where I satisfy my ambition to achieve. They are cathedrals 
where I practice my religion.
the effects of a crash can be devastating. Seeing Kieran go down like that adds darker details to my perspective. The hope one feels the moment before they see their x-rays. The pungent smell of countless medicines and remedies for the incapacitated. These simple details will always come in association with injuries in my mind. When one falls into this misfortune, they lose an essential piece of themselves for a while afterwards. The letdown is detrimental, and resentment rises like a brackish tide as they lay in waiting while their body tries to regain its former mobility. Something that can be so rudimentary in almost any sport can have after effects that forever brand themselves upon one's mind. We bury those memories and push forward with righteous vitality ready to charge into the winter months.
Kieran and I are driven to new zones in search of winter's remains. Like two archaeologists seeking the fossilized skeleton of some prehistoric beast. days lose their frigid cold. We're forced onward, pursuing our love for the season with grim determination. has become fragmented. Climbing north, scaling the jagged topography of British Columbia, where it can once again thrive on the higher climate. It's in these zones, where winter lasts into summer's relentless furnace, that we find its eternal cold and thrive on. Winter begins to retract itself from this part of the earth. My craving continues. Like a substance, I've succumbed to its addictive traits. It is here in British Columbia where I have found my true beloved.
ETV UK, Sarah Duffy here from Mount Buller in Australia. Our ski season is between June and October every single year and we would love to see you for a ski down under sometime soon. Voilà, Richard. Une baguette, comme tous les matins. Our needs may be few, but our wants are many. Higher, faster, bigger, deeper, gnarlier. We want our brains melted and constantly crave more, more, more. Well, get ready, because here comes more. Slow down! 
120% more impressive. 60% more gripping. 80% louder sound effects on every turn and landing. Ninety percent more insightful athlete interviews. I feel like I'm floating when I'm skiing, and in that moment, nothing oh, else matters. God. Cut. We've heard that a thousand times. Freedom. Ninety percent less athlete interviews. Yeah. One hundred percent more ripping women. Two. Oh, all these pies. One hundred eighty percent more authentic live audio. I've got that, like, sweaty, I've got a poo feeling. Ew. 10% more soul. Did you get the shot? This is ridiculous. Close boy, hit her again. 450% more pro skier, husband and wife interaction. Careful, Cody, there's rocks below you. Hey, there's rocks below you. 250% more masterful editing. Nailed it. Oh, that's nice. Oh, stop. Stop. Ooh. 160% more cinematic. Cinematic means slow motion with a moving camera and exaggerated sound effects. One hundred fifty percent tougher. Oh, no. <laughs> Three hundred thirty percent more stoked, stoked. <laughs> Percent more sand. Oh no! Sorry, send. My bad. Yay! Three hundred percent more sand. What? Yeah. Add it all up, and that's two thousand one hundred ninety percent more. Logan. So much freaking more oh. that this movie's gonna make you wanna. Everything. I thought that was kind of referring to us. Like, we drop everything? Whatever. Oh my god, you should. <laughs> Mark Abba, Marcus Ader, Michelle Parker, Sammy Carlson, Eric Hewlettson, Cody Townsend, and Elise Sogstad, Tanner Rainville, Aaron Blunk, Sander Hadley, Chris Rubens, Connery Lundin, and more with a guest appearance by J.T. Holmes. Hey. How's it going? Damn knuckle draggers. Doesn't anybody turn anymore? Drop everything. Drop everything. Dropping this September. desires lurk in the shadows and hatch a plan to murder their monarch now two devoted warriors must protect the orphan heir to the throne and save their kingdom
Det er en stor aksjefabrikk, men det her er det verste jeg har på. Du blir nesten tullet i hodet av Sivun. Det var bra, så det var jo bra i starten, men i Holmland så sitter vi så lenge i hockey, så vi er jævla stive i beina, så det svir jo og brenner jo noe jævlig. Det visste vi på forhånd, men det er vondt faktisk, selv om det er bare nedover, så er det skikkelig vondt. Nei, jeg tror det var 349 stykker som ville slå meg. Så jeg følte når jeg tok teten at jeg ble jaget av et helt felt. Så jeg prøvde å ta vare på den jensen så lenge som mulig, så det holdt dessverre ikke helt inn. Var det noen skittende triks der oppe? Nei, det var egentlig ikke det. Det var forholdsvis fair på starten her, men nå vet jeg ikke hva som skjedde lenger bak i feltet. Men jeg har jo lugget litt bak i feltet der på Hommel før, og da vet jeg at det er litt skittende triks folk trekker. Det var helt forferdelig. Beina mine skjelver, og jeg har ikke ord. Det er mye adrenalin. Ja, det har det, men det blir litt for lange etapper for meg. Jeg er vant til å sitte i hockey i fem sekunder, og det er det. Det tok det vel seks minutter, så det var fælt. Today, I'm going to ski the line of my dreams. I will finally land that trick that has broken my body into pieces several times. I want to be who everyone's talking about. No one's going to call me a pussy. Today. Do fear and doubt ever stand between you and greatness? That line definitely does not go. Erase it with Disafear, the world's first over-the-counter medication with the mystical ability to make apprehension completely and immediately vanish. Oh yeah. Disafear is not recommended for those with a propensity for making bad life choices. Do not use Disafear to overcome common sense. Disafear may impair musculoskeletal function and result in a rapid blood rush to the extremities. Some users report intense paranoia. Should Disafear haunt your dreams, discontinue use and ride it out in a safe place. Disafear may cause a lack of respect for rocks and other solid objects. Ja boy! Some Disafear users are at a risk of slipping into an indifferent state of euphoria. A small percentage of Disafear users experience only momentary effectiveness, which may result in uncomfortable situations. I am so scared right now. Disafear users don't care about hitting Tranny. Do not expect Disafear users to learn from their mistakes. Despite sensations to the contrary, Disafear will not make you Candide Thovax oh no. or Henry Carlo. Both general and acute bodily pain as a result of taking Disafear could be a sign of a serious condition. If you experience an erection for more than four hours while taking Disafear, enjoy. Hey! You watch your dirty mouth! Use of Disafear by women who are pregnant or breastfeeding may cause your baby to prematurely become a badass mother... Other side effects of Disafear include, but are not limited to, shin bay, blood loss, severed limbs, projectile vomiting, healing loss, contused organs and egos. Disafear. Why let fear 
stand between you and greatness.
Ouais. ouais. Saw you the other day Looking so on the mind Acting like it wouldn't happen Making sense of anything that you could find Because it's just about to happen And you'll be there Have known the storm was coming when the clouds are
I'm privileged to have grown up in the mountains and skied my whole life, and I want to see my kids still being able to ski and their kids being able to ski. People that spend a lot of time in the mountains and people that spend a lot of time outside are basically on the front lines of it all. They can see it happen firsthand. We feel like we need to be doing less of this, less of that. But I don't think it's about doing less, I think it's about doing more. Sign I've ever skied. That was so sick. The slough was insane, dude. It's Tommy down there. To the oh, getting a little too old for this shiza. Raise your hands, boys. All right, to boys. Sky. Here we go. You will be redeemed. You can set the soil. I'm gonna go fist right here. I'm gonna ski that right there. That's pretty good. <laughs> Hi Ski TV UK, Sarah Duffy here from Mount Buller in Australia. Our ski season is between June and October every single year and we would love to see you for a ski down under sometime soon.
This is Ski TV, the coolest channel. Just a parallel turn away on Ski TV, the coolest channel. The Ski Club of Great Britain catches up with ski legend Boldy Miller. Jeff and Roy from the Ski TV production team check out the exclusive resort of Gestad in Switzerland. If you're coming up to here to uh, Gestad, you can come and see us uh, here on the top of the mountain, the very top, and as you can see, it's just a magnificent view. Welcome to Gestad. We ride along and land at the airstrip in Megev, France. And the Faction Collective displays some of its awesome on-snow talent. Plus, much more on this edition of Ski TV, the coolest channel. First up, Bodie Miller chats with the Ski Club of Great Britain. Um, so we're here with former World Cup skier and Olympic skier, Bodie Miller. Um, thank you, Bodie, for talking to the Ski Club of Great Britain. Um, it's been a, two years since you've retired. Um, do you miss ski racing at all? No, I don't. I mean, I think there's maybe parts of it that, that are, you know, it's exciting to ski on those courses when they're in perfect condition. But no, at this point, I love skiing still. I go out and, and ski quite a bit. And uh, no, I'm happy to be done. Do you follow the ski racing still? Do you still watch the um, the guys on? Did you watch Kitzbühel this year at all? I watched. I was actually skiing that day um, up in Jackson Hole, so I, I didn't watch the race, but I saw highlights afterwards. I, I catch some of it. I don't really watch um, many races because in the U.S. they're not they're not on that often. So, um, but I do think that uh, it's also natural after you did the sport like I do. You kind of it's not so interesting to watch for me. Even when I was doing it, it wasn't that interesting to because watch. Because you've been and done it and you've had the feeling, yeah. I guess. Um, and the guys now, they either do speed events or tech events, but you were kind of an all-rounder and, um, well, you were an all-rounder. How were you able to balance all the disciplines and the training? Um, badly, I would say. I mean, I think it's, it's not really, I mean, it is about balancing them, but there's always like a drawback to it. There's maybe some benefits too. You might pick up little things from the other side that you know help, but in general, it's just a time crunch. The whole season in Alpine World Cup is really tough anyway. You start in October and you have 40 races till uh, March, but even if you do, that's really why guys, it's not because the, the difficulty of the racing or the training, it's just the compression of the, of the whole series. So. If you're racing four events, you're really traveling Tuesday. You have official training runs Wednesday or you know Wednesday, Thursday, and then race Friday, Saturday, Sunday, sometimes Monday. Um, if you do that week after week after week, it's just too much. I think it's it's really hard. So for me, it was I liked it, even though I knew it wasn't maybe what was the best for my results. But it was it was the way I liked doing it. So. That was kind of, I didn't need to explain myself to anybody, it was kind of my choice, but I think it frustrated my coaches a lot that I wouldn't focus because they wanted me to win more races and I, you know, I think I understood where they were coming from, but for me it was the right thing. And you got bomber skis now, Has, was that always a passion of yours? Was that always in your mind, even when you were racing, that you wanted to bring out your own style of ski um, into the public? Yeah, I mean, I, I always was pretty innovative with skis. I mean, from bringing the shape skis around in the U.S. to, to changing the, the style of skis we used in racing quite a few times. And I felt like it was a shame that skis had become so commoditized and so cheap. Cheap is great. I love cheap skis if they're good, but they're not good. You know, when you, when you build them in China and you try to build them for as cheap as you can possibly do it for like 40 years in a row, um, with really no correction at all. It would be like if you built a car as cheap as you could for 50 years in a row and everybody was doing the same thing, just absolutely as cheap as you could make it um, because then your margins were as big as they could be. 
if nobody else is doing anything different, it, it doesn't really show up. But I know different because I raced on World Cup skis. All our skis are handmade, and it was pretty obvious to me that someone had to come in and build really good skis. And even if they were more expensive, at least you were offering something that had the ability to enhance the experience and make things more fun and safer. So um, that part of it was always kind of in the plan. How it happened, I, I was a little bit surprised. I would have thought I would have just done it on my own because I had people who I think were um, interested in, in funding it. But uh, the company's really, it's, it's a good company, really good people. And um, you know, I'm happy to be able to, to accomplish that goal. And do you have any advice for people that want to get into ski racing, like young skiers? Um, what's your main advice for them? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, it's a lot about opportunity, you know. There are the exceptions where somebody's just a gifted athlete or something happens, but in general, you need to have the opportunity to spend a lot of time on skis. When I was young, that was my big advantage. I was in New Hampshire, and I skied all the time. I skied, you know, almost every single day that the mountain was open. So, um, you know, and, and having fun with it, that's big. I mean, you don't, you don't ever get good at skiing until you're older period even if you're good when you're 14 or good when you're 15 it's still like that qualification for 15 you know like you're not nobody wins world cups at 14 15 and um so you have to be patient enough to make it to 24 years old you know if you want to actually race at the very top if you're just looking to race it's a it, that's i really love the sport just for that part of it like for recreationally having some fun adding something new to the sport, going and entering some local races and stuff. But taking it seriously is really tough. It's like, as soon as you start pushing, it's like, and, and like most things, it's addictive, you know, because you, you start to figure things out and you get ad addicted to it and you want to get better and better and better and better. But in the end, it's, it's a tough sport. It's, injuries are really extreme. You know, the human body is not really designed for that kind of thing. So I love the recreational racing side of it. I don't think it's... You know, if you want to race professionally, you better make a very conscious choice about that because there's a high likelihood you'll end up poor and injured <laughs> at the end. <laughs> oh, well, thank you, Bodie, for talking to us. Um, th this was the Ski Club of Great Britain with Bodie Miller. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up on Ski TV, the coolest channel, The Faction Collective.
And it was just perfect. Skiing with the kids, awesome scenery, long lunches, endless laughter. And we even had some powder days where we could get some really deep turns in that went on and on uh, and on. Uh, um, thank you, David. I think that's probably enough for now. Sorry, Karen. Sorry, everyone. <clears throat> so, we do have a new face with us this week. Everyone, please give a warm welcome to Rebecca. Hi, Rebecca. Hi, Rebecca. Hi, yeah. Um, I wasn't sure if I should come tonight, but um, my friends said it would be good for me, so uh, here I am. <laughs> I, I didn't think I was doing anything out of the ordinary. I was doing the weekly shop, you know, as you do. And I found myself in the frozen aisle, just loitering. And then I put a bag of frozen peas on my face. I've done that. Have you done that? I've done that. Yeah. It's been 285 days since my last ski trip, but I still think about it every day. Throwing open the curtains and seeing the mountains all covered in snow. Grabbing your ski boots from the heater. Oh, it's like a warm hug for your feet, isn't it? It doesn't matter how many times you go, nothing beats the rush as you jump onto the chairlift and before you know it, you're at the top, setting off and... Yeah. And those first few turns. Nothing beats those first few turns. Yeah, especially when it's fresh cordial. David! Spoken about this. Sorry, Rebecca. David does have a tendency to get a little bit overexcited. I think I went a little off piece there. <laughs> now you mention it, though, I do love a bit of off piece. Yeah, off piece is great, but I'm more of a snow park, big kicker kind of guy. I'm more of a cruisy blue stock for a hot chocky kind of gal. Marshmallows on top? Hot chocolate. No, 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 no. It's all about that cold beer after your last run. Or oh, you could get a burger with that beer. Or a cheese fondue. Or a cheese fondue. Look, can everyone please just slow down? Did you say slow down or snow down? <laughs> you heard what I said, David. Then I you know what? I love the apres. That thing so sakes on your tongue. I don't mind a bit of that Euro pop. <gasps> Goggle tons! Snowball fights! First lifts! Green runs! Black runs! Hitting kickers! Beer! Ski school! Powder days! <laughs> Ski obsession can affect anyone. If you or someone you know has been constantly thinking about the mountains, contact Crystal Ski Holidays or visit the website for more information. Hello, Crystal Ski Holidays. How can I help? <laughs> Right now on Ski TV, the coolest channel, come along and join Jeff and Roy from the Ski TV production team as they explore the great resort of Gestad in Switzerland. here to uh, Gestad, you can come and see us uh, here on the top of the mountain, the very top, and as you can see, it's just a magnificent view. Welcome to Gestad. The 
sind hier im wunderschönen Skigebiet am Horning hier oben, im äh, Skigebiet Schönried in, in Gstaad. Das Einzige, was man hier am besten tun kann, ist hier hoch zu uns ins Restaurant kommen, eine schöne Zeit, eine Flasche Champagner bestellen und einfach relaxen. <lacht> top of the peak walk at 3,000 meters at the Glacier 3000 experience in Switzerland and it's a great experience if you ever get to do it. Gut bürgerlich, that means uh, it's not, uh, it's high class food, of course, but not uh, like Nouvelle Cuisine or something like that. This is Jack, uh, here in Gestad. And, uh, what is the name of the place? Wuba. The Wuba. This is a lovely place to be. It's this. It feels like authentic, it has this, this music that makes you chill out. A lovely place. Very important the music. We've uh, got my own playlist. And you know, food is for your body, music is for the soul. Exactly. So, it's a whole combination. Yeah. Yeah. Come to visit us, the Wubar. just wishes and he's gonna arrange it. That's quite a service. And then joke start. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Very good. Thanks a lot. Well, Thank you for this. Ski TV, the coolest channel. It's time to visit the ski school. In this video, we're going to look into the three most common mistakes when it comes to carving and how they may be limiting you from having less than an awesome time when you're going skiing. We're going to look into the problems themselves and also some exercises and how to fix them. And if you spend some time taking care of your common mistakes, you're going to have way better time skiing and maybe one day it even looks great like this. If you want to carve like this guy you know take this video out and what's cool about this video is that i learned to ski by myself with nobody there to teach me so i developed like pretty much all of these common mistakes that we're going to show you in this video and also show you some exercises on how to correct them yeah Let's exactly let's go carving with Kerr. Let's look into the common mistake number one when people are carving that they're twisting the upper body in the direction of the turn which results in the skis are then sliding out and it takes then a while to untwist that before the upper body and the skis are pointing in the same direction again. And then you already have a bit of rotation in the upper body that's gonna make the next turn also probably skid out. If you find you have a tendency to finish the turn by rotating up the hill, mm -hmm. resulting in the tails of the skis washing out, then I maybe have a solution for you to try. 
All right, why should I try? So, gonna need to ditch the poles here for this one. A little bit of coordination required. So the exercise we can try, we ditch the poles. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna take our outside hand. In this case, my right ski is the outside ski. So I put my right hand on my hip. My legs do the lovely steering. But I'm gonna counter with my body. I'm taking the inside hand and I'm gonna point it across towards my outside ski and down the hill, the direction right. of travel. This will then change as we start the next turn. The hands will come up and it'll change to the left hand side. Does that make sense? All right, let's see if it makes sense for you as well. Start out focusing on putting the right hand on the right hip when you're turning to the left. And then the left hand extends towards the right ski's nose to break that uphill rotation that causes you to skid out. A bonus effect of this is that it helps to angle the upper body more so the upper body is rather straight and then the legs angle out in that way. First of all, practice the exercise as we showed you. And then you can look at details like where you position your hands so that you don't drop one hand like behind yourself. Make sure that they have both hands in front. If you can see them, it's sort of a guideline that they're probably in a quite okay position. So, Mr. Jens, if you find that you're reliant or have a tendency to sort of just tip the body, drop the inside shoulder to get the ski onto the edge, yep. you may encounter some problems along the way. You'll find that on steeper slopes, you lose pressure and grip through your outside ski, your downhill ski in this case. Again, it seems to be our left one. If you're in variable snow, when you've got kind of powdery patches onto like really sheet icy patches, you get that whole whoo, and you may even, you're gonna have a lunch. You're gonna fall inside. <laughs> and have you're a gonna, lunch? You're gonna slide. All right. Maybe a long way, I don't know. So a little exercise we can have a shot of is we take our poles from the normal position, mm -hmm. turn our hands upside down on them, so that we reveal the poles to the ground in this manner. The pole tips or baskets are gonna drag along in the snow. All right. Throughout the whole turn. So our legs are gonna do all the lovely stuff underneath, but our poles are gonna stay in contact with the ground. Particularly, again in this case, our left one, the downhill pole. And that's gonna encourage the upper body to come from this position, more into this position, which will make sure we've got a bit more weight on that outside yeah. ski to maintain grip. And should I be careful that I don't accidentally go like that and I'll stab the ground? Yeah, yeah, me, so. yeah you don't want to stab yourself or the ground. Oh, so. <laughs> so yeah, just let them relax and drag a little bit behind you or even just beside you, level with your hips. Make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. Do a whole run or a few doing this exercise, but I understand if you don't want to be skiing around like this all the time. So when I was learning to ski properly in my early 20s, I found just being aware of the importance of this and like feeling how the g-forces from the ski and the hand like it's pushing down there adding to that nice kink in the body and putting more weight on the outside ski see it's happening here again it's um, just knowing it can make a huge difference if you find sometimes that you're leading in to the turn a lot with your inside ski so in this case if I was turning around there I'd lead in a lot with my right ski and my hip just goes to, onto that ski you might feel like your outside ski wants to break away again you're gonna lose you're gonna lose any grip at the start of the turn and you're just rushing the whole thing by plonking your hip from side to side yeah that's totally a problem I used to have it's understandable because you want to get to that point in the turn where you're gripping and when you are getting lower to the snow However, you're not allowing the turn to be built up All right. in an appropriate way. So how should we do that? It's a little bit of thinking along a different process here, rather than an exercise. As we start the turn, as we stand up into the turn, 
we want to like pull the inside ski back and change that weight onto the new outside ski and allow it, be patient allow the skis to come around into the mm -hmm. downhill position before finishing the turn with the lovely ankles and knees yeah and i think it could be a good idea that you look down and see how aligned the skis are and that you pull one back and push the other one a bit forward right so essentially the picture is opposite to what we're we've got going on here rather than the inside ski leading into the turn it's a little bit the outside yeah. ski leading into the turn and then we'll get more even weight in the skis yeah. it'll be sick let's yeah. do it okay so maybe you want to look down on your skis and if you see that that the inside foot is still leading pull it back if that's not enough you can also focus on pulling the inside foot back as you're pushing the outside foot forwards and if you get this right it's gonna feel way better turning and um, you know, get a bit more weight on the outside foot it does really feel pretty good when you really push it in a nice carving turn hey thank you guys for watching i hope you learned a lot of about how not to ski and thank you man for joining all good i hope it was useful i hope there were some things in there that can help you skiing yeah if you're unsure i guess leave a little comment and we can see what we can do Kurt, get you hijacking the freaking comments yeah. <laughs> spiel i could not hijack i, I talk about comments oh, sorry. I, i'm getting too excited james i'll back i'll back down. back back off sorry back off. no i'm so impressed <laughs> you're gonna muscle yens out of his own business soon don't don't tell him no, no. should we just no, i've cut yens out now it's just you and me should we just get on with the stomp it thing and ditch the Swede? I mean, he knows now, but... <laughs> it's <my> show! <laughs>
out of boredom you have brought me something, given me something that I will never forget in my whole life. When I'm in the mountain, my vision is my lifeline. You can't afford to make a mistake. Ski TV, the coolest channel. Get your party shoes on. It's rave on snow time at Salbach Hinterglem in Austria. Channel. My name is Roy and look at here, we're here at the Rave Festival on the, the Festival of the Berg. Ski TV, the coolest channel. Megève in France has one of the most challenging landing strips in the entire world. Ski TV production crew recently hopped a ride to experience the thrill. des éliminatoires.
Let's do it again! Well, welcome back to Ski TV. I am Hannah White. I'm delighted to be joined by Mark Lightfoot. We are here in the heart of London at the Ski and Snowboard Festival in Battersea Park. And Mark is somewhat of a technical genius because uh -huh. he's come up with an incredible new business. Mark, tell us a little bit about it. Oh, it's an it's a online platform uh, that specializes in ski properties. It's called Snow Only, uh, snowonly.com. Um, basically, we've built um, a place where buyers and sellers can go to our website, um, have an efficient, efficient platform to buy and sell their ski properties. So it really is, excuse, excuse the sort of comparison, but right move for ski properties. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly what it is, but we're very specific. I mean, obviously, for ski properties, in my opinion, you need to have um, a certain amount of information to complement the listing. Um, how many blue, red and black runs, um, altitude, uh, lift pass prices, um, and we've got all that information on there that complements every listing that goes on our website. Yeah. So unlike just buying a normal property, you're giving them more information about the surrounding area, about the resort, about what sort of skiing that they can expect yeah, to find exactly. in that location. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's vital information when you're, when you're buying something like that. You know, part of you don't just buy the property, you kind of buy into the resort and, and you have to have that resort information to, to complement it. Yeah. And you're a relatively new business, I know there's been a lot of behind yes. the scenes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we launched about seven months ago, um, but it's grown really quickly. We've got over 2,000 properties listed, um, our, our, our website's been viewed in over 100 countries um, and we're expanding, you know. I, it's, I think, hopefully, it's something that people want, want and need. Um, the real estate agents want to re reach a wider audience. That's what we can provide. Our subscription fee is so small in comparison to the commission they would receive. And it also gives private sellers that maybe haven't been able to have an audience an easy platform to put it on. Yeah. Well, the days of shop windows have gone, haven't exactly. they? You know, I mean, and... look, to be fair, saying that, I mean, we, we value local real estate agents. We're not there to to hinder them, we're there to help them. Yeah. They have the local knowledge that we don't have. Yeah. We're just sending them the buyers, that's what we're doing. And maybe we're just giving them a wider reach, that's all. How on earth did you come up with this idea? Uh, I mean, where did it all come from? You live in Asia, I mean, a long way away by Japan, a long way away from a lot of well, well, I was a real estate agent for 10 years, so I feel like I've kind of got the other side as well, so I understand, understand the process. I, I spoke to a lot of people and a lot of private sellers of ski real estate and they couldn't sell it. No. And, and I've been in the game where I, I want a bigger platform and I just thought, I mean, I know I love skiing, so that was a bit of an excuse. Um, but I, was, I, I wanted to build something that gave everyone an equal opportunity to sell their ski property. You, you know, ski, ski property is a bit of a niche and I think you, you just need to get an audience and hopefully with the subscription that we receive, we can spend on marketing and it works for everyone. That's the idea. Do you have any statistics about the amount of properties owned I, by, you know, all of those? Yeah, it's scary. It's um, we found some really good information recently. There was, there's, don't quote me on this, <laughs> but it's close. There's like six and a half thousand resorts in the world. Yeah. You know, six and a half, one resort being the three valleys that is made up of, you know, Courchevel, Val, you know, it, it's huge. Um, uh, the lady that I spoke to at Moorsey the other day, 3,000 listed residents. It, it, it's, it's, it's massive. Yeah. Parks, it's just ginormous. So the, the, the numbers are, I, I can't even, no. it, it, it's, it's oh, too big. Yeah. What about the visitors to the site, people looking? What, what nationalities are you looking at? Yeah, we've, yeah, tons. Uh, is the UK a big market? UK is a massive market, but for Europeans. And that's maybe where I'm, I think in the longer term, we're trying to change it a little bit. So most of the European agents go to the UK market. But living in Asia, I know that's not really true. In Phuket, where I met a lot of people, we have people in Phuket buying properties in Deer Valley without even seeing them. You've got such wealth in, in Russia, China, Hong Kong, Singapore. And they want to buy properties in these places, but if the local real estate agent isn't going to do the marketing to attract them, someone's got to do it. So hopefully then we step in. Right? It's an exciting times, yeah, isn't it? It is exciting times. I mean, we, 
we, we hope we can just do a bit of a service that maybe just makes the real estate agents um, reach something they can't. Yeah. And, and for a very, very small amount of money, for the, for the price of it will cost, you know, a nice bottle of wine on the slopes. It's, it's not a, a great expense. And of your listings, is there a particular area? Is, is Europe the focus? Is, is North America featuring? Uh, at the moment, we predominantly um, uh, have Europe as the focus, um, but we have some staff in Australia that will then work, um, New Zealand, Japan, Australia, and then eventually we'll go to America. But I think to start with, it'll be, yeah. it'll be European. I mean, yeah. Europe's such a massive beast to tame anyway. Yeah, but loads, you know, but... Also the kind of smaller resorts that people are maybe just don't really know about. Yeah. That It's nice because, you know, most of the people, they talk about the big ones like Bowder's Era, Maribel, but there's, there's smaller ones there that I think people there's, there's still property there and well, there's nice places to see, and it might be slightly cheaper and it's quite easy access so we want to get those listings and so. I think sometimes when you own a property you don't always want to be in the the really touristy places you know they're the places you go on holiday yeah. for one week a year yeah. rather than where you own a property yeah. So. Yeah. And, and also it needs to be affordable for everyone like typically if you go to Verbier you're probably paying two million dollars for a property not everyone can afford that so <laughs> not many people, you talking, can, not many people can afford it so um, Especially as a holiday home. Yeah, there's some lesser resorts that are maybe slightly outside Verbier where the price is yeah. like it's half the price. Yeah. And, and, and we just want to get a bit of awareness. And, and, and importantly, we want to make it efficient. So if someone goes on to, I don't know, let's for example look at Val Air, there's every single property in Val Air. Yeah. You don't have to then spend a week with a real estate agent saying this, 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 this. It's just all there. You can do it over a cup of coffee and then go, I'll have that one and that one. It just makes their life a little bit easier. That's brilliant. Now, how can people find you, Mark? Uh, just go to snowonly.com yep. and take it from there, really. Very simple. Well, Sign up. Yeah. You yep. see, the ski, the snow sport industry is vast. It's not just about going skiing. It's about property. It's about travel. And we've got everything here at Ski TV. TV UK, Sarah Duffy here from Mount Buller in Australia. Our ski season is between June and October every single year and we would love to see you for a ski down under sometime soon. Det er et stort aksjeforbud, men det her er det verste jeg har på. Du blir nesten tullet i hodet av siden. Det var bra, så det var jo bra i starten, men i Holmland så sitter du så lenge i hockey, så vi er jævla stive i beina, så det svir jo og brenner jo noe jævlig. Det visste vi på forhånd, men det er vondt faktisk, selv om det er bare nedover, så er det skikkelig vondt. Nei, jeg tror det var 349 stykker som ville slå meg. Så jeg følte når jeg tok teten at jeg ble jaget av et helt felt. Så jeg prøvde å ta vare på den gjennelsen så lenge som mulig, så det holdt dessverre ikke helt inn. Var det noen skittende triks der oppe? Nei, det var egentlig ikke det. Det var forholdsvis fair på starten her, men nå vet jeg ikke hva som skjedde lenger bak i feltet. Men jeg har jo lugget litt bak i feltet der på Hommel før, og da vet jeg at det er litt skittende triks folk trekker. Det var helt forferdelig. På beina mine er det der, og jeg har ikke ord. Det er mye av adrenalin. Ja, det er det, men det blir litt for lange etapper for meg. Jeg er vant til å sitte i hockey i fem sekunder, og det er det. Det tok det vel seks minutter, så det var fælt.
day. It's just uh, it's just fun out here in the sun with all your friends, you know. Yeah, level one to ten. <laughs> ten. Solid ten. Ten thousand. Yeah. Woo! Loving. Out of the way. They're fearless. They're nuts. You catching it? <laughs> By day, they're the finest hot dogging, freestyle skiers in the world. By night, they really take chances. <laughs> you busy for dinner? Now that's a girl I can take advantage of. This is the motion picture comedy that's proud to go downhill fast. The movie that defies the forces of gravity. Sanity. Hi Ski TV UK, Sarah Duffy here from Mount Hi Ski TV UK, Sarah Duffy here from Mount Buller in Australia. Our ski season is between June and October every single year and we would love to see you for a ski down under sometime soon. Hi Ski TV UK, Sarah Duffy here from Mount Buller in Australia. Our ski season is between June and October every single year and we would love to see you for a ski down under sometime soon. Hi, I'm James from Nick Snow Sports. We've been making skis in London for the past three years and this is how we do it.
This is one of our bamboo core blanks. Most people don't realise that skis are actually made predominantly with wood, um, with composite layers around the outside. Um, it's actually what gives the ski most of its characteristics. So we use bamboo, it's incredibly strong, it's um, you know, super durable, it's got a really nice flex pattern to it. Um, and this is kind of how it starts out, so it's a big block and it gets put onto the CNC machine, which is where we give it its profile and its shape. So because it's a manufactured wood, it's um, the way that it's made into boards from the raw material is that it's, it's cut up and then glued back together in these very long straight fibres. Um, so it lends itself incredibly well to something like skis um, and it, it means that you can tailor it particularly well to individuals so you can add composites or change the weights of fabrics and, and really adjust the feel of it. So once we've got all the information we need, we take it into the computer and build a CAD model, so a computer model of ski core. From this, we can then send this to the CNC machine, which mills out the profile and the shape of the core. This is where the bamboo core blanks go to be profiled, so the machine will uh, cut it literally to its individual core profile. Um, it's basically stuck down to this with a big vacuum, and then the machine head will cut it. So we can, we can change how it, the, the flex um, is across the length of the ski, we can change the shape of it, we can do everything different every time if we need to. So now that we've cut the various base components out on the CNC machine, we assemble it together essentially like a jigsaw um, before we start to put the edges on. The next step is to bend the edges to the shape of the ski. Uh, we do this by using edge nippers to uh, force the edge into the, into the shape we want. Now that we've got our edges attached to the bases, it's time to get it into the, onto the cassette to start laying it up. So we're using a two-part epoxy resin, this one's actually a bio-resin, and you basically mix the two parts, which starts a chemical reaction, at which point we can start laying up with it. And we're essentially wetting out all the different um, aspects of the ski, so right now we're getting it into all of the tines of the, the metal edges, and the epoxy is the glue that actually holds it together. It works in the same way as a glue does, except this one requires a heat to activate it. When different um, materials heat up and cool down, um, sort of you've got like a metal, a wood and a plastic, they'll all do it at a slightly different um, rate. So you need something in between the layers to stop that shearing force from breaking apart the bond of the, that the epoxy makes. So this is essentially a really, really thin uh, rubber foil which goes in between and creates that kind of sort of anti-shear layer. Now we're onto our composite layers. This is um, the first of, we're going to have uh, three different compos composite layers in this, in this build. Um, this one is a traxial carbon fibre which means it's got um, fibres running in three different directions, so you've got fibres the length of the ski to give it um, stiffness along the length and you've got plus or minus 45 degrees to give it some torsional stiffness. What we're doing here is wetting out the fabric and then when it goes into the press that will cure and that's what gives the, the composite its strength. Now it's time to put the core on, oh god my fingers are bloody snippy. <laughs> yeah so the core's on next. These little grooves here are called rabbit, uh, rabbit grooves. They're basically um, little slots that sit over the top of the edges so that when you press it, it all sits flat. You don't end up with a concave base. Next up, we've got the hybrid sidewall. So this is new for this year. So it's essentially a thin strip of um, ultra high molecular polyethylene, so PTEX, same stuff the base is made of. Um, and it sits on top of the side, on top of our Banbury sidewall and gives it a bit more of a um, edge protection um, on the top interface. This is our tip fill, so it's um, again uh, same as the base material, it, it sits on the edge and protects the tips and tails of the ski from impact. So next up we've got our reinforcement layers, so we've got a couple more layers of, of uh, carbon fibre sitting over the tip and tail and the binding areas. Um, so for giving yourself, you know, giving the ski some binding retention and a bit of extra strength at the join for the tip and tail filler. This is our second composite layer, so it's essentially another, another full sheet of carbon fibre. So again, we're going to go through the process of just wetting it out, saturating all the fibres with resin. We've moved to, to carbon because it means we can drop the, um, the weight of the fibre while sort of retaining the strength of it, but um, carbon by itself gives a very sort of um, lively ski, but not necessarily in a good way, so we, we match it with flax to dampen the vibrations um, because it's a really nice sort of damp, forgiving ride, essentially. This is our flax layer, so this is the, the layer that um, adds the damping, so it gives it a bit of, of um, longitudinal rigidity as well, but it, it predominantly adds damping to the, to the carbon fibre layer. Flax is um, a natural fibre, so it's the same stuff that you, uh, that jute bags are made of, um, and it's yeah, it's starting to be used in the skin industry a little bit more because of its mechanical properties. So the final step of this before it goes into the press is to get the top sheet on. Um, so we offer basically a bunch of different options. There's a lot of stock ones which are the ones that come as standard with the models, um, but you can also choose to have a uh, completely custom design if you really want to. 
Yes, we just um, completed the sandwich, putting the top layer of the cassette on, um, and this will help spread the load uh, across the width of the ski when it goes into the press. Now that we've got the top on, um, it's ready to go into the press and cook for a couple of hours. Basically, the setup we've got is an adjustable press, so we can put in different camber moulds, different tip rockers, um, and really tailor the shape of the ski to, to anything, you know, any application. So it's a pneumatic presser that works by um, compressed air being blown into these bags, which puts it down with the pressure onto the, onto the jig and pushes everything into the final shape of the ski. So the press is heated, which is what helps the epoxy actually cure. Um, so we're just ramping up the temperature as it, as it sort of uh, presses, the temperature increases and, and slowly gives it that really strong bond. So now the ski's out of the press, um, we'll let it cool down and then it's a case of cutting it out and we'll start finishing it. Um, we'll start by jigsawing out the rough shape and then we'll start to clean up the edges. Now that we've rough cut our skis, uh, we're going to get them onto the base grinder just to flatten out the bases so we can start profiling the side walls. Now that we've cleaned up the side walls, you can start to see the uh, ski take shape. So the next step is to put a bevel on the side walls. Um, this basically means we'll put an angle onto it to stop you from catching your edges and chipping it. So we've beveled the side walls and now the final step is to just clean up the top sheet, um, shape the tip slightly and then we're good to go. We've now got our, our bevel finished and um, sanded off um, and it's now time to stick this onto the base grinder and do the finishing passes to smoothen off the base so it's ready to go. So the last process on the base grinder is this cork finishing belt and this basically just takes off any little micro, micro PTEX hairs that are left on the base from the grinding process. Now that we've finished the actual build process, the final thing to do is take off the protective top layer and we're good to go. Yeah, so thanks for following us through how to make a pair of skis. If you'd like to find out more, uh, just go to the website at nicksnowsports.com. TV UK, Sarah Duffy here from Mount Buller in Australia. Our ski season is between June and October every single year and we would love to see you for a ski down under sometime soon. Red Bull Skills is a wahnsinns Rennen, wo vier Disziplinen auf einmal fast ohne Ski wechseln. Vom Super-G rein in den Slalom, noch ein weiter in die Abfahrt. Und zum Schluss nochmal, äh, der Riesenslalom ist natürlich konditionell auch eine recht große Herausforderung. Ja, schwierig mit diesen Übergängen. Einerseits weißt du, so ist das Grad von was du denkst, habe ich kurze Ski. Und andererseits braucht es noch ein Tor ab und zur Richtung. Mir hat sofort erinnert, dass wir früher wie, wie im Weltcup-Start stehen, so, so ist es zugegangen, ganz weit hoch konzentriert. Und jetzt haben wir ein paar einige gesagt, sie sind brutal nervös. Das ist für den kompletten Skifahrer perfekt, gell? weil so beim Riesenslalom, da kommt gleich einmal einer vielleicht ganz, ganz gut dabei sein. Aber da oben, da drehen sie dann das Spreu vom Weiz. Ich habe mir zuerst mal den Laufen angeschaut und habe die Tücken herausgefunden sozusagen. Es hat dann anscheinend ganz gut gepasst. Natürlich mit dem ersten Platz ist schon was Besonderes und das passiert nicht jeden Tag. Super, ich freue mich überhaupt auf dem Ski, weil auf den habe ich mir am meisten Zeit. Ja, jetzt schauen wir mal, dann am 3.4. wird es in die Lenzerheide gehen. 
Und das wird sicher ein cooles Event. Da werden wir alle heiß drauf sein und es Beste geben. Sales Manager, Big White Ski Resort. Big White has always been built just as a ski resort and it's not actually even open in the summer. It's a winter resort. Our season starts usually around the beginning of December and we'll run through until mid-April. It always snows here. It never rains at this elevation and we have 2,500 vertical feet of perfect powder snow. Yeah, the resort in general, it's uh, located halfway between Vancouver and Calgary. If you're familiar with Canada, we're in British Columbia. Uh, we're known as Canada's favorite family resort, located outside of uh, Kelowna, British Columbia. So to get to us, it's, it's quite easy from here. Aussies think that uh, we're quite far away, but uh, you can fly uh, Air Canada via Sydney, Qantas via Sydney, or Air New Zealand via Auckland. So very easy to get to, very popular with Australians. Uh, we're actually owned by Australians. It's a really unique weather system. You get the uh, wet air coming off the Pacific that collides with uh, very dry air down in the valley. We're actually just above a semi-arid desert, um, so the snow is dry and light and beautiful all year round. Because of the dry snow, a lot of people can get introduced to skiing powder here where they don't have to necessarily be on a steep slope. They can be on a fairly gentle slope because the snow is so light they can go through it. Yeah, yeah, the, uh, the Mount Buller crew, we're familiar with them. We actually sponsor the, uh, the Mount Buller Race Club, so uh, very popular. However, our owners used to own, uh, used to own Mount Hotham. It's a very rugged mountain. Uh, we've gladed a lot of the terrain as well, so there's some great tree skiing. There's some really good steeps and there's also wide open uh, groomed cruisers. Everything here is skiable, whether it's on a trail or off piste a little bit through the trees. Mother Nature put the resort here and we just simply took advantage of it. Yeah, so the, the resort in general is, um, like I say, it's Canada's favorite family resort. And um, it goes from, uh, we go from 1,500 meters up to 2,300 meters. So it's, it's a little bit lower than, you know, maybe some of the Colorado resorts and a little bit higher than, than say, for instance, a Whistler. So we get uh, seven and a half meters of snow a year. And that's really what we're known for is our, is our snow and the quality of snow because of our inland location. Big White and the Okanagan is sort of smack dab in between Calgary and Vancouver in the interior of BC. So it's only about a 40 minute flight from Vancouver, about an hour from, from Calgary. You do not need a car. You do not need any type of transportation other than your ski or your snowboard because everything's ski to, ski from. All the restaurants are within walking distance. It's a pedestrian village. Uh, favorite hangouts? Well, you know, I like to hang out at Big White in general, but uh, for fine dining, probably six degrees is uh, really good. Uh, if you want to go out to a nightclub or a pub, probably Snowshoe Sands. A lot of places you're on a bus uh, for, for quite a long period of time, whereas here, uh, you dictate the pace. You get out of bed when you want to get out of bed and you go for a, a slide, you can go back to your chalet or your condo for lunch. So you really not only get that, that ski in effect, you actually get the ski out effect where you can walk out of your lodging, put your skis on and ski down to a lift. Uh, we're located at bigwhite.com and uh, lots of useful information there. Um, we've got videos of the resort, there's, uh, uh, there's 360 views of, of accommodation, there's aerial photos and lo lots of information there and uh, actually if an Australian logs into our website from Australia, uh, it will give you everything that you need, I guess, that an Australian would need to know. We're very fortunate with the accommodation because we really do have the whole gamut. You've got everything from a youth hostel on the mountain to your own small apartment. When we've got it all the way up into units like this one here where you've got beautiful appointed uh, luxury accommodation, uh, you know, private hot tub on your deck. Um, just a great winter experience to have. We don't have crowds, you know, we don't have lineups on the lifts, so the pace here is pretty relaxed and I think that carries through to the way the staff treat the guests on the mountain. We uh, pride ourselves on being uh, Canada's favorite family resort and when it comes down to family obviously we need to take care of kids and uh, we think that we take care of kids really well here.
We've got programs for all ages and ability levels. Uh, kids often progress set. Uh, ridiculous rates. They're uh, from brand new skiers and snowboarders to up on the chairlift uh, within a few hours. Big White has a myriad of different dining experiences here. We can go from the top end in our fine dining environment here like the Kettle Valley Steakhouse all the way through any of the walk-up cafes and bars and restaurants that you would find in the village. Once you're here you're here. Everything is within walking distance, so it's the convenience factor combined with tons of great snow and a, and a beautiful resort village that just is the ease of access. We're really a, a stressless holiday. It really relates back to the people serving you dinner at night or making your beds or tuning your skis. It's not a job to them, it's a lifestyle. And when you can work in a lifestyle that you love, it just reflects on our guests and it just makes for a happier vacation for our guests. Rob Crichton, International Sales Manager, Big White Ski Resort, Canada's favorite family resort, and you're watching skitv.com.au. Got Ski Club of Great Britain Ambassador. Now this is my favourite workout, the resistant band workout. This little guy is super compact, you can throw it in your bag and work out absolutely anywhere and it really does enhance your workout by adding resistance so you build muscles quicker. First up we have an exercise I learnt when I skied with a Canadian ski team. Place the band above your knees, feet hip width apart. Making sure the other hip stays still, rotate one knee in and pull back out into alignment. Repeat on the other side before lowering into a squat. Sticking with the quad muscles, use a thinner large resistance band because next up we have the box squat. Step onto the band, feet shoulder width apart, Raise the band above your head with wide straight arms. Trying to keep your upper body tall by pulling your shoulder blades together, lower your tailbone towards the ground. Using the same band, moving on to our first hamstring exercise, again stand on the band, feet hip width apart, raising the band over your neck and holding it tight to your chest. Drop your hips back, whilst lowering your upper body forward with big emphasis on keeping a straight back. Finish the movement at the top by squeezing your glutes so that your hips end slightly forward. Next up we have a two progression small band hamstring exercise. First up, legs only superman. Place the band above your knees and extend one leg behind you with the foot pointing down. Try and keep the hips level throughout. Slightly more challenging is the same movement pattern but standing, either supported by a chair or the wall. Put one foot in the band and extend to a straight leg behind you. Taking a lighter resistance band if possible, place the band just above your ankles and adopt a plank position. Squeezing the glutes, keeping your core engaged, pulse your straight leg twice towards the sky. Using the same band placed above your knees, drop down to a side plank on your knees. Lift the top leg up and down, keeping your body in one straight line. You can also hold in between pulses for a bigger muscle burn. This is another favourite that you see all over Ski Racer's Instagram accounts, the Monster Walk. Place the band above your knees, sinking your hips to the ground in a semi-squat. Step laterally, 
making sure you lock your hips parallel to the ground. The lower you go, the tougher this becomes. Next up we have the monster crawl. Drop down to the ground, moving forward using your opposite hand and leg with level hips. More challenging is to then crawl backwards. Using two longer bands, one to make an anchor, loop the lighter band through. With slight tension on the band, stand facing your pillar or banister, with feet hip width apart and a small knee bend. Move down into a squat and as you extend up, rotate to the side, straightening your arms and letting your back foot extend onto the toes. Like the finish of a golf swing. Place the stronger band over your hips. Holding the band with your inside hand, take a small lateral lunge away from the pillar, pushing up and off to balance on the inside leg with parallel locked hips. Ending on my favourite exercise, the only way I have ever found to get massive ski angles without actually being on snow. With the same band layout and positioning as the last exercise, move away from the pillar so the bands are in full tension so that they can take your body weight. Keeping your feet planted, slowly move your ankles, knees and hips away from the pillar, simulating high ski edge angle. Once you're at your biggest edge angle, use the spring from the band to power your hips into a neutral transition position. If you want to see more of my ski fitness videos then please check out the Ski Club of Great Britain YouTube channel. Thanks for joining me and have a great time on the slopes. Sense of anything that you 